Today is February 19th, 2023, and my guest is journalist and author Megan McArdle of The Washington Post. This is Megan's seventh appearance on Econ Talk. She was last here in December of 2021 talking about belonging and national identity. Uh, we're going to start our conversation today talking about lobotomies and mental illness, but the overarching topic is about confronting our errors, professional and personal, the challenge of confirmation bias. I want to warn parents with young children that this episode will likely deal with a number of adult themes, including those related to Oedipus. Well, that's a pretty good teaser, I thought. Megan, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me, Russ. Uh, we're going to talk to start with about a recent column you wrote in the Washington Post, which centered on Walter Freeman, a doctor who was, until your column, obscure to me, uh, and a biography uh, written in 2007 of Walter Freeman uh, that you wrote about. So tell us, um, tell us who Walter Freeman was. Uh, tell us how you got interested in, in Dr. Freeman. Well, let's start with the second question because I came across a reference. It was a glancing reference in an article about something else. And in fact, I don't even remember what the article was, uh, but this really stuck with me. It was a reference to the fact that Walter Freeman died in the early 1970s still believing in lobotomy. And that was shocking to me because I think, and I think we're going to talk about this uh, later in the podcast, there are later in the podcast, there are, you can kind of understand how lobotomy happened in the context of a world where there were just no good treatments at all for mental illness, uh, for most kinds of mental illness, where especially, you know, severe things like schizophrenia, the alternatives were, you know, Freudian pseudoscience that didn't work. And doctors were desperate, and they did a bunch of desperate things, of which lobotomy was the most horrifying, but the others were were pretty villainous themselves. And tell, um, our, tell our listeners what a lobotomy is. A lobotomy is you basically, so the, the prefrontal lobes of the brain, um, they control a lot of things like impulse control. They are personality and, you know, sort of desire. Um, they... You basically stick an instrument in into the prefrontal lobes and you kind of take bits of the brain out and leave a scar is the closest. Um, uh, that was the original operation. And then, you know, Walter Freeman's advance, if you can call it that, was that he would take a pick-like instrument. Originally, actually an ice pick was how he started, how he got the idea originally. Um, and he would insert it... Um, sort of next to your eye through the eye socket into um and there's a the bone is very thin at the back of the eye socket and he would just sort of tap force it through the the bone into the prefrontal lobe and then he would just kind of wiggle it around for want of a better term um and that of course would leave some pretty serious scars on your brain um and uh it is it produces an effect it makes people apathetic. No, it, it's actually, I shouldn't say it does anything because this was so unscientific. They had no idea what they were doing. They didn't, when they started, they didn't have any idea what the lobes did. Um, and so it actually really depended on what the operation, you know, where they happened to hit and how much damage they did. Uh, but it frequently left people quite apathetic, which if you're treating an anxiety disorder, looks it's sort of confusingly like a cure. Um, and they did, I mean, Walter Freeman himself did thousands of these. He started in the 1930s. He was the the big, it was not actually, he did not actually invent the procedure. That honor goes to a Portuguese doctor named Egas Moniz, who received the Nobel Prize for it in 1949, by the way. Uh, never rescinded, um, which is sort of tragic because, in fact, he deserved the Nobel Prize for his work on uh, on angiograms. And But what he got it for was this horrific operation. Uh, partly, you know, due largely perhaps into the lo lobbying of Walter Freeman. But Walter Freeman was the American entrepreneur who picked up the operation. Um, and it went out of favor basically as soon as the first antipsychotics were developed in, in 1954. And as you started to get lithium and Thorazine and all of these other drugs that were just even if you don't think, even if you are part of the movement that says that, like, you know, psychiatric drugs are bad, all you're doing is sedating patients and so forth, um, they're definitely better than just hacking around in someone's brain. 
And so the operation starts to fall out of favor very quickly with the medical establishment, which had always, by the way, been somewhat queasy about it. But Freeman never, he never gave up on it. You know, in 1968, just a few years before he died, he is, he is telling people, you know, I, I think this is a great operation and, uh, and it's, it's due for revival when, when surgeons make their mind to it. And so that captivated me. I thought, how could you be so wrong about something so obvious and not and not realize it? And so I started reading about his life and and the procedure. And in 1967, he performed the last lobotomy in the United States. The patient died. Um, and the biography that that you draw on mostly is by Jack Al High. Is that his name? That's correct. Okay. I also read a, a couple of other books, uh, including something called The Lobotomy Letters, which is a fascinating, it's it's very academic, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it as light reading. And indeed, I will say that, that part of the reason this, this project has taken me a year and a half to produce one column, um, and the reason it took so long was that every time I got to a description of the procedure, I would have to take like a two-week break. It's really, yeah. really difficult, unsettling reading. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, it's fascinating to see how the, you know, the, the letters between him and patients, between him and other people to see how he thought about the procedure, but also about how they thought about the procedure, which is not at all how we would assume that they did. So talk about that and talk about how he, at the end of his life, was um, talking to patients he had, he had yeah. uh, operated on. So he maintained throughout his life a voluminous correspondence with his patients. Uh, you know, he exchanged Christmas cards. He, and I think some of this, he was not a particularly warm man. He's not really, I'm going to be honest, a particularly likable man. I would like to make this into a tragedy of this this wonderful man who just made one mistake, but this is not the case. He 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 was vain and overambitious and had decided that lobotomy was his route to being a, a bona fide you know, medical, pioneering medical hero. Um, and which is part of how he did go so wrong. I don't think this is all, that's, that's not all that happened there. He generally did care about his patients and did believe he was helping them. Um, but he, in when he first proposes doing this procedure, there's, there's quite a mixed reaction. Um, and a sort of elder statesman of the field who is, by the way, I think one of the reasons that this caught on is that, you know, he had support from people, older people in the field. He was also fantastic at getting press in a kind of gross way. And, and to see how much the me how big a role the media played in creating the uh, the support, social support for a lobotomy was pretty disturbing. Um, but. Uh, you know, is this guy who stands up and says, no, I think this is when people say, are you, are you kidding? You're just going to start rooting around in people's brains. Are you mad? This guy stands up and says, no, I think this is really interesting, but you should take detailed case histories. And so his whole life, he's taking extremely detailed case histories, he's following up with the patients. Um, and, um, you know, I sort of went into this with the stereotype that basically everyone has, which is the Ken Kesey, this is a means of social control. And I don't want to say that it wasn't ever a means of social control. It absolutely was. Um, there, were, there were absolutely tragic cases of people who were lobotomized because it was in some way more convenient for the caregivers. Um, and I think the that Ken, we do have to... The Ken Kesey reference is a reference to the... Book one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yes, I'm sorry. One one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Where famously the troublemaking patient who is not mentally ill at all, who has gotten himself into an asylum as a way to uh, avoid prison, um, he he gets lobotomized at the end of the book, and that happened. But also, I mean, we do have to understand the context. You have people who who cannot live in the community because they are violently psychotic, because they are delusional, because they are so anxious that they're hurting themselves by washing their hands, you know, 97 times a day. Um, those people are ending up in institutions. The institutions are horrible. Um, there's a really sad story of um, a surgeon whose son had always been prone to violent fits. And this is, I mean, this is still a common problem that parents deal with of severely disabled children 
is that you have a little kid who, yeah, it might be prone to violent fits, but it's pretty easy for the teachers to deal with them. And then if it's a boy and it goes through puberty, that child gets very large and un- and and you can't just, you know, grab him and hold his arms. Um, and what this surgeon is looking at, he's like, I'm afraid that the alternative is my son spends his life in a straitjacket. And so, you know, we assume that there was no informed consent that this was, no, they, they, these these patients were often thinking deeply and thoughtfully about it and not just about, you know, is it, is this person, is it going to be more convenient to have my, you know, disabled child sitting quietly on the couch than having, you know, like going out and, and making trouble? Um, there, although there is also some of that, right? There, one of the things that comes out of lobotomy is a different idea about informed consent um but so he's following up with these patients and then as he gets older you know this this operation goes out of favor he moves to california he sort of still continues operating but at a reduced level and then in 1967 as you say he killed a patient who was actually someone he had um he'd operated on before she died on the table and um, that's the end of his career. But even before that, he had started, he was always someone who loved road trips. Even in the 40s, he would go. And in fact, tragically, one of his sons died um, on a road trip, falling into uh, like a waterfall. Um, but in, in from about 1956 to 1969, he just goes on these frantic road trips. He's cross, you know, doing twenty five thousand miles in a in his car. Or at the in nineteen sixty seven, he buys a camper bus and spends really. I mean, at this point, he's got cancer. He's badly wasted. He's missing a big chunk of his colon, and he just goes on the road and he is just collecting as many patient histories as he can. He called these his head hunting trips, um, which had been. I mean, as I say, this it was he could be quite grisly. Um, he used to call those when he would go on the road and do a bunch of lobotomies, he would demonstrate it to other doctors. He was not just responsible for the 3000 that he did. He was responsible for a lot of other doctors doing a lot of other lobotomies. He was a retired, he was a tireless entrepreneur promoting this, this horrific procedure. Um, but now his headhunting trips switch to just finding people, taking case histories, figuring out where they are. And the thing is that like in a lot of cases, they're very happy to see. And people were, there were people who were satisfied with their operations. And so first of all, there were people who went on to have not a lot. There were people who went on to have like really quite high powered careers. There's a someone who finished her math PhD after her lobotomy and and went on and got a job as a professor. There was, there were lawyers and, and doctors and, and, you know, um, important people with important jobs who had lobotomies. This is by far not the majority, but then Walter Freeman's defense would be, well, that wasn't the majority of people, right? Um, which, you know, is is somewhat fair, I guess. And so he goes on these trips and and there were people who would recommend lobotomies to people that they knew. It'd be like, this was great for me. I'm going to recommend this to my friends and family. So our, our understanding of of lobotomy is this thing where you just end up with this you know, this zombie vegetable who does what they're told is not correct. Um, that said, it was a horrific procedure. The, the side effects were terrible. It did, it produced apathy. It could produce incontinence. It could produce seizures. It could, I mean, a, a stunning number of his patients died on the table or shortly thereafter. Um, I'm not defending lobotomy, um, but it wasn't what I thought it had been. And so that was a really, really interesting uh, so thing to learn. When he went on the road... I and mean, obviously couldn't get on a Zoom call with them in 1968, but he wanted to Correct. do more than write them a letter, evidently. I uh, could have written them a letter. He knew, I guess he knew where they were. So he went on well, the road. Well, some of them, he really tracked them down. Like he would, he would just track them down through like changes of name and job and address, you know, because you remember all the women who, any woman who got married would change her name back then. Um, so it was really quite an impressive bit of detective work to have tracked down as many as he did. And. Do we have any sense? And I'm stunned that anybody thought it was a good idea, any patient, or that any patient went on to a successful career of some kind. Um, do we have any feel for the overall impact of at least the thousands that he did? I mean, it's one thing to say, yeah, there were some people who survived it and did well, or, well, most of the people, you know, a lot of them died. Um, do we have any feel for what the the landscape looked like 
for, for I don't think there has been a systematic study done. I mean, this is um that I am aware of. Um which is, I mean, I may, the, a reader may write in to correct me and I would be very happy to learn that there is a more systematic. I, th I think that it, part of it is that like it was what they were doing was so variable, right? right. There's no, you, you're going in through the eye socket, you can't see where you're going. You know, today, if they do brain surgery, they've got like, they, they're, they're imaging the brain. They're doing these extremely precise print because they will still sometimes do things to the prefrontal lobes because, for example, you have, you know, some you get a brain tumor there. You have, but they're, they're taking extreme care to be extremely precise about where they're hitting and to minimize the damage to surrounding brain tissue. And, and that's not what they were doing. Um, they often did two or more lobotomies, you know, they would, they would follow up and well, it wasn't satisfactory. So let's do another one, which is insane. Um, so I don't know what the, the systematic effect was. I think that the general perception is that it was not good, right? This, yeah. this, it left people apathetic. It left people, it damages your impulse control. So some people would like, go on alcoholic vendors or, you know, they would otherwise disappear. Um, it left people, you know, people wrote into me actually, interestingly, after I wrote this column and said, yeah, no, I had an aunt who this happened to, or I had an uncle who this happened to. And I remember them as a kind of quiet person who did a menial job and, um, didn't say much or, you know, people would be home and they wouldn't, you know, they would be cared for until they died. Um, I, the median outcome, I do not think, was was you got a math PhD, right? Yeah. I, mean, I don't think no, that's I can, close to the median outcome. I it's understand. it's it was mostly an extremely damaging operation. Um, I think what the doctors would say is that the people that they were dealing with were often in institutions, and that Freeman at least maintained that the majority early on, at least that you know the majority of the people he he worked on were out of institutions after he worked on them. And that that was better than where they'd been before. He was not under any illusion that this was side effect free. Um, but I do think that he he was looking for it to work, right? And he was looking so hard that he saw what he wanted to see. You saw the evidence that it was good and you didn't pay attention to the evidence that it was bad. It reminds me of shock treatments, a similar um, shot in the dark to try to help people who were otherwise uh, unable, I want to say, unable to integrate themselves into the normal pace of life. Yes. Uh, I mentioned- and they, Which uh, are, by the way, still done for severe depression. Really? Uh, they're much better that, yeah. So they're, I mean, so I said earlier on that, that um, lobotomy was just one of this array of terrible treatments. So there was one, oh gosh, I, I can't, not I've never pronounced this word is metrazole I think um was a convulsant it, they've discontinued it because it was um it kept killing patients um but they they had a number of convulsive treatments electroshock was one they would put people in the diabetic comas um they would use this this convulsant drug and um but we still now most of those we don't do. But the the electric shock is still done for extremely refractory depression. If you are severely depressed and you cannot get over it, and you know the, it, you basically have no quality of life, um, they will and drugs don't work. They will try electric shock, and it actually does seem to work. We do it much more humanely. I mean, back then people used to break their legs from the shocks. Um, and and one thing that he actually uh, early on Freeman would use ECT electric electroconvulsive therapy he would use the electric shocks to anesthetize the patients it was just insane and they would break their legs i mean it was it was terrible like really the the whole just barbaric this whole thing but they were also dealing with these incredibly barbaric asylums and they didn't know what else to do with people and we have better alternatives and we should remember that it is easy to pass judgment <laughs> when we are not when we have alternatives i think i think the there are many disturbing aspects of the story. Uh, one of them is the fear that if you convince yourself that it helps people, you could start changing the population you think it's appropriate for. Uh, I think I mentioned on the program before that you know John Nash, the Nobel laureate in economics, when he was 
in the worst of his delusions and um, challenges mentally, he was a very unpleasant person for his family to be around. And they often did things to him that were against his will, but they never gave him shock treatments because they did not want to damage his brain. They knew and recognized that he had an extraordinary cognitive uh, tool that whether it could be used for good or not was not the question. There was something precious and rare about it. And so they limited their damage to him to incarceration, physical restraint constraints and other things, but not shock treatments. I don't think they lobotomized him either. I'm pretty confident. I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure. No, they that I, pre- I, I'm reasonably, I, I feel yeah. like I would remember that part. Yeah. It has been a while since I read the book, but I, Me feel too. Like I, would, but, I feel like it actually would have been mentioned because the most famous person to have been lobotomized was uh, John F. Kennedy's sister oh. um, that I'm aware of. I mean, there are some cases that are famous for their lobotomies, but as far as I know, the most famous person to have been lobotomized was John F. Kennedy's sister, um, who was somewhat mildly brain damaged during birth, is my understanding. She had, I don't actually know the details, but I think she had some mild cognitive disability. And the, I don't know if this is true. Um, so the, one telling of the story, one thing that you will hear a lot is that Joseph Kennedy was afraid she would become sexually active and therefore had her lobotomized. I don't know that that's the truth of it. I do know that it the the lobotomy did not go well. Um, his wife never forgave him. Um, and that Rosemary spent the rest of her life in an institution. Um, which, I mean, Joseph, goes to, this was, this was a horrific operation that should not have been done. Joseph being John F. Kennedy's father. Yes, sorry. Uh, who was a had some unattractive aspects. I'll just say that and we'll move on. Um, but but the point is that, you know, there are people who are, who have unbearable burdens and, and either trying to survive those in an institution, which is a terrible challenge in the first half of the 20th century and before. And then there are people who are just unpleasant or difficult to deal with. And I think the in any of these treatments and these include, you know, pharmaceuticals as well, the temptation to change where you decide this person is um, beyond the pale the, of of consideration that we would give a, a, quote, normal human being. I think that's the challenge. And I, I don't have anything to say on that other than to, that would be the issue I would worry about in, in, the, in this case. And I'm, I don't know if Walter Freeman drifted over the course of his life in, in terms of recommending the procedure for people that maybe 20 years before, 10 years before, he wouldn't have. that That's what I'd be interested in. Well, I mean, I think that there definitely is a, you you see sort of early on, um, you have this thing and you just start recommending it for more and more things. It's a really common phenomenon yeah. in, in medicine. Sure. Um, but it's also at least my read on it. And, um, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist. So is that things were so pre-scientific then they had no theory. They, I mean, it's just shocking how little theory they had of what they were doing. Right. They didn't understand what the lobes did. Yeah. And and often doctors would kind of mix up this bizarre Freudian theory with the, um, you know, with the lobotomy. Or there would be you people would find Freudian therapy afterwards, which we also know doesn't work. But like it would, you're piling treatments that don't work on each other. And I, actually, he was mad about the the Columbia Math PhD because she credited psychoanalysis with with fixing her problems. <laughs> he was mm. he was extremely angry that she didn't credit the lobotomy he'd given her. Mm. Um, but you know, I, I, there was definitely mission creep. There was definitely, there was also the fact that, yeah, people would end up in asylums because they were difficult. Right. But then there's another question that I think you have to think about, which is, and so again, I think something caregivers still grapple with today. So with, for example, you will frequently read articles on how nursing homes are over sedating uh, patients with dementia. And the thing about patients with dementia is that they can reach a point where they just scream all day. And it's really unpleasant for the caregivers. And if you sedate them, they stop screaming. Now, are they feeling better? Tough question. Right. But but 
it makes things easier for the caregivers. Yeah. It might be easier as a caregiver to have someone who is quiet and who is apathetic Docile. Docile. than to have someone who is extremely anxious and pestering you all day about their obsessions. Yeah. Is that person better off? I would not say that stirring their brains in order to make them more pleasant to be around, right? Like the, the, these are the deep questions and why we have evolved our conception of informed consent to say, no, it can't just be that the family thinks, right? With children, yes. we say, you know, the family makes the decision appropriately um, because a 10 year old cannot form informed consent, right? We should try to make sure the 10 year old understands what's happening, but they are not adults. They cannot picture the future they do not you know have the grasp on um the trade-offs that they're making and so families make those decisions but with adults you know you it can't just be that your caregiver is is tired of having you be noisy and but that said we still do in fact use drugs that have sedating effects because it makes life easier for the caregivers right we still do um and we tell ourselves that we're helping the patients and maybe we are, I am yeah. by no means an expert on these things. So I don't want to opine, like I, I'm not going to get into the, the, um, the, the questions over what appropriate treatment are. What I'm going to say is that I think we need to be conscious of the fact that the caregivers and the treaters have their own incentives. Yeah, that's all. That's and what I've said. That that it is easy to convince yourself that you're doing the thing that's good for you, that the thing that's good for you is good for the patient too. And that it, it's very easy to do. And I think we all have to be aware of that. That and you, you, you call them caretakers and say an, an old age home for that includes people with dementia. It also includes classrooms, regular yep. modern public school, private school classrooms where kids many times are difficult and there are sedated not literally turned into docile, um, sleepy creatures, but they are molded and changed by the drugs that are recommended for them in their own name. Sometimes perhaps they are. Sometimes I worry they aren't. Um, but I'm gonna, let's come back to Freeman because I think this is the, the most poignant and powerful insight of your piece. The story so far is interesting, and for people who don't know about the history of this type of treatment for mental illness, I hope of, of value, but the um, you suggest in, in your piece, and I assume taken from the biography, that Freeman wasn't just accumulating data about his former patients. He was looking for comfort that what he had done was yeah. right. I think that's quite clear. Um, I mean, first of all, he, this is a man who, as I think I said earlier, he was extraordinarily vain and he, I mean, like in a way that I understand, right. I, I want, I want my work at the Washington post to not merely be workaday columns that people read. And then, you know, they're, they're forgotten. I want to be writing deathless and immortal prose. And in the same way, he is a doctor wanted to be doing vital life-saving world changing work and not merely, you know, slightly improving the lives of some patients. And so that had always been a, a thread at the beginning of his life. And then he had the misfortune, you know, he becomes quite famous. He becomes, you know, he's the head of multi multiple medical societies. And a thing that I'm going to just stop and interject here, even though it's not strictly relevant, is, is one thing that I think people would probably find surprising. He, as the head of the DC Medical Society, led the charge to desegregate it. And I think this goes again to the ways in which my expectations of what a lobotomist would be like were not met by Dr. Freeman. He was a more complicated figure than that. Um, but he um, he saw his own reputation wane in his lifetime. There had always been people who were queasy about the procedure, the, um, but he... But after 1954, it starts to fall into disrepute. And he sees this reputation that he has accumulated. He sees it slipping away. And so, and especially in the 60s, when people are really starting to ask a lot of questions about lobotomies. And um, and he wants to prove to people, no, this was a good operation. It is a good operation. Not even it was a good operation, right? I mean, that at least I think would have been more defensible to say, well, we did this because we didn't have anything else. 
and it was not great. You know, once upon a time we used to do operations we don't do anymore because we got antibiotics or, you know, we, we did treatments that we didn't don't do anymore. Um, I mean, like it, here is an actual good example of something that sounds totally barbaric and worked and was probably the best alternative. Um, for syphilis, they used, there was a treatment for syphilis that involved um, one, one treatment, uh, which is made famous by Isaac Dinesen, the author of Out of Africa, um, was an arsenic-based treatment that worked, but I mean, had crippling side effects. And another was literally giving patients malaria because the incredibly high fevers of malaria kill the syphilis spirochetes. sheets. Well, you know, that's probably better than having syphilis but it's not as good as penicillin. And so, you know, I think doctors in that position can just say, yeah, you know, it was not great, but it was all I had at the time. And I'm glad that we don't have to do that anymore. Right. Um, but that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is it's still good. We should still be doing this. And he is on a salvage mission at the end of his life. And he really was, I mean, it, you know, by the time he finished his last trip, he weighed 140 pounds down from, I think, 200. He had already had his colon resected. He'd had a colostomy. I don't know if he still had it when he was on the trip, but he was really sick. His cancer had metastasized. He knew he did not have that long. And there he is on his road trips, just like trying to, I think just genuinely part of it is just, he was a kind of a lonely man who liked to drive and liked to go on road trips. But I think a lot of it was, yeah, he was trying to salvage his reputation. He was trying to find evidence that look, look how great this worked. How do we know um, that? How do we know that other than, how do we know it was something other than just he needed something to do at the end of his life or he needed, he he liked his patients and wanted to see them. Why, why do you, why do you feel that he was uh, cherry picking his case history. I don't think he was, I don't think it was cherry picking. I think, I mean, this is the thing again, like he, we, we want him to be a pseudoscific scientific barbarian and he wasn't, he did more careful patient histories than most, right? I'm not sure any other 20th century physician went to such great lengths to follow up on his patients. And I don't think it's one or the other. I just, how do I know this? I am reading. I mean, I think his biographer agrees with me. He, he praised my column, but <laughs> so that's one way. That's valuable. But I mean, um, I'm reading the fact that he's still telling people that this operation is good. I'm reading the ways he is. I'm reading who he was his whole life, his whole life. He wanted to be, he wanted to be a great man and not just a doctor, right? He wanted to be a pioneer. He goes to, to, he was for a while, kind of the only game in town is, as by the way, he was not a surgeon. He was a neurologist. Um, and which is one thing that like people were very angry that he was effectively doing surgery because he he started working in partnership with the neurosurgeon and then the neurosurgeon and then he invented this new procedure that you didn't really need to know how to do surgery for because you're you know it's 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 an off, it's basically an outpatient procedure but the surgeons are very jealous and this is the the dumb thing right the surgeons are right that it's a bad operation but it comes off as like professional jealousy how dare you be doing surgery rather than but this whole operation doesn't work whether or not you open someone's skull or um and so you know i can't prove that it was a salvage operation but i think that it's it's clear to me that he was he was very eager to resurrect he's telling people that this is a good operation and it's you know it's it's due for a revival um and he thinks he thinks every time he takes a case history, he thinks he's got proof of how great this is, right? Like that is the thing is like he really thinks he's piling up evidence and he can't see it. He cannot. Well, he had, as I said in the column, a little selection yeah. bias there. He's not visiting the ones who died. I, I don't know what that number was, but uh, I think his mort his mortality rate was I think between one and three percent. It was quite high. Not unheard of Seems for an operation, but to me, I'm surprised. <laughs> um, I could I could be wrong about that. I'm not. I would have to go back and look that up. Okay. I could be wrong, but I th I think it, it was in the single digits. But it was it was significant. Um, and it was, and a lot more people were left debilitated, right? And those people are not necessarily easy to find, right? It, like. <laughs> they're not running back to you if they're they're mental yeah. vegetables. 
Yeah. Um, although their families might, right? They, he's often he's often writing to the families. He's often speaking to the families. And some of them, by the way, are really angry at him. Some of them really think that this did not go well and they're very angry. And others think it was great. And others are kind of mixed on it. it you know, it is a mixed bag. I don't want to over-present the... the he, he violated, as I said in my column, uh, Richard Feynman's great first principle of science. You must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. Um, and I think that here. that's... Yeah, he he believed he believed that he was he was accumulating evidence for how wonderful this operation was. He sincerely believed that, um, and that is what has always haunted me about his life. Is that you know, is the end of his life? He still couldn't see. He had made this tragic mistake, and he still believes that there is some way that this is going to turn around. A quick Google search suggests it's about five percent the mortality rate. Um, so we'll. Well, until Sorry about notice. that. I, I, that's okay. I am a, I'm a bad. You don't have it at your fingertips. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Neither do I. I just use Google. I might be wrong. Um, but, you know, I I want to talk about the more interesting case, more interesting point to me, which is uh, your description of this quest and what you call the Oedipus trap. So um, give give our listeners uh, a little background on Oedipus and why you use that phrase for um, Dr. Freeman and so, the moral and psychological and aspect of this challenge. Yes. So this is not, uh, by the way, the Oedipal complex, uh, although they're, they're rooted in the same Greek myth, which is that Oedipus was, uh, he, as an infant, he was prophesied to uh, kill his... Uh, father and Mary as mother. And so in true ancient Greek fashion, they decided that the solution to this was to expose the infant so that he would not be around to do this. Uh, and of course, as like this frequently happens, right, he is picked up, he ends up um, in Corinth uh, and he hears the same prophecy. And so he leaves, he leaves his town and he goes out, um, meets a man on the road in a fit of road rage, kills him, um, goes into the city, um, and finds Queen Jocasta, meets Queen Jocasta, uh, marries her. He is, and she is his mother. He has killed his father, her husband. She does not know that, that he does not know that the man he killed on the road was her husband. He certainly doesn't know that that was his father. A plague comes upon the city and eventually the truth is revealed. Whereupon and he Jocasta. Wait a minute. And he doesn't know that he's married his mother either. No, he, nice. does, he doesn't know any of this. He does not know who these people are. He thinks that his adopted parents are his parents, right? So he is completely unaware that he has fulfilled the prophecy uh, in an attempt to evade it. Uh, and when the truth is revealed, uh, his mother hangs herself, and then he grabs uh, pins from the, the dress that is still hanging on her body and gouges his own eyes out. And, you know, the, there's obviously a lot of things that you can draw from this what freud drew was the the idea that we are all actually that all boys are secretly fixated on marrying their mothers but what i drew on this was that drew from this was that there are some mistakes that no one can live with even if they were made innocently and that the trap is that if you have made one of those mistakes it is obviously much better not to know that you have done so. And so when you add in just normal human confirmation bias, I would like my scientific theory to be true. I would like, you know, the 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 way I raised my children to have worked and so forth. Um, that if you have made a mistake of this caliber, you will do everything in your power to avoid recognizing that you've done it just out of psychological self-protection. And as Richard Feynman says, you are the easiest person to fool. And so I think it is a personal tragedy for Walter Freeman that he got trapped in this way. That, you know, because I was reading, I was reading that he, when I, I read the initial thing to go back to what I said at the beginning, I got interested in this because I read some throwaway reference to Walter Freeman just never getting over um, his love affair with lobotomy and so eventually it, it just stuck with me and a few months later i went back and i i looked it up and i you know i'm reading this and i thought 
how could he? How could he have been so blind? And then I thought, no, but how couldn't he have been so blind? If you have inserted a pick-like instrument into the brains of thousands of patients and irreparably scarred the, the seat of their consciousness and personality, how could you ever let yourself know that you did that? How could you ever let yourself know that it was a bad idea? Because how could you live with yourself afterwards? And I think that is, I mean, I, I, so I think of it as um, both a, a personal tragedy and just a, a fascinating story, a terrible, terrible story. But I also think of it as a, a great warning to other people, first of all, to avoid uh, such traps wherever possible, right? And to to really ask yourself when you're you're going to do something, if this went wrong, could I could I even stop myself? Could I go back? Right? Could I? Will I be able to live with myself if I've made the wrong decision? And like sometimes you have to make those 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 decisions because you also couldn't live with yourself if you if you didn't do it, right? If you, um, you know, foreign policy is one of those things where you often. You have to make really big decisions and they could go really wrong in a really terrible way. And could you live, you know, could you live with that decision? Maybe both things are things that you couldn't live with if they went too terribly wrong. Um, but then if you do have to make that kind of decision, I think medical situations are the same thing. You know, if you if you look at what we do for cancer patients, we we will often pump the the standards for a drug to treat cancer patients are so much lower than a drug to treat almost anything else. Precisely because doctors like the what's the alternative? Just go home and die, right? So, um, so sometimes you do have to make those decisions, but if you do, you need a lot of safeguards to make sure that you don't end up in an Oedipus trap where you cannot recognize that what you have done was a mistake. And he didn't put any of those safeguards, and he, you know, he and his partner read about this procedure, get super excited about it, and then they set themselves a goal of doing you know, 20 in four months and they hit it and they killed one patient at least. Um, and they had, they had scarred the brains of 19 more. And at that, even by then, I wonder if his fate wasn't kind of sealed. Cause do you, what do you say? Oh, oh, that was, that was a bad idea. No, every time, every, every lobotomy you do, you need you, increases your need to believe in the lobotomy. Yeah. I, you know, there's, there's so many, um, it's hard to think of a politician. I mean, I can't think of one. Doesn't mean there aren't any, but I can't think of one who made a significant decision and regretted it publicly. Publicly. Um, one obvious example would be dropping the atomic bomb. Um, I'm sure, I, I shouldn't say I'm sure. I think. I don't know if Truman ever expressed regret for that decision or unease. I've heard many justifications for it. They have some, you can, they're, it, it's an interesting, not an easy moral question. I'll just say yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's a really good example of something where, you know, the alternative, if we hadn't dropped the bomb, was a really, really, really bloody invasion. Yeah, and the claim was a million American soldiers would die. Um, and you know, the, it's funny how that claim, when I was younger, and, and I guess a little less, um, conf, a little more confident about things, when people would talk about the atomic bomb, I'd say, yeah, but a million soldiers would, would have died. Like, it's a fact. It's yes. not a fact. <laughs> it's not even a, right. an I, estimate. I, we don't know, right? It, it could have been that, that maybe Japan would have surrendered through these. We have no, right. We'll never know. And maybe right? it's, well, the fact that they didn't surrender after the first atomic bomb was dropped is is, is alarming. Uh, it gave some credence to the claim, but I'm just talking about the million number. You know, as yeah. a I was somewhat um, as a patriotic American in my youth, maybe jingoistic's a better term, who's less patriotic now because I don't live in America anymore. I live in a different country. I live in Israel. I look on that and I think, why did I think that number was so comforting for that decision? And the answer was because, well, a lot of reasons, but it's a bad number. It's just a big, yeah. it's a big number. It's a round number. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a, the kind of order of magnitude that kind of ends all arguments. 
if you think it's true. But of course, it's not true. Right. It's a it's a guess, an estimate. A, a st- you know, I, I don't know what else to call it. Um, but I don't. You know, that was a, you know the people who were in, involved in that. Paul Tibbetts, who flew the Enola Gay, you know, later in his life certainly showed no um, moral unease with that decision. I'm not suggesting he should have. I'm just saying, consistent yeah. with what you're saying, people who make what we would sometimes think of as difficult ethical decisions in, in foreign policy that often result in tens or hundreds of thousands, if not millions of deaths, rarely, if ever, say, you know, wish we hadn't gone into fill in the blank and, and invaded fill in the blank. Yeah. I made a mistake. I misunderstood uh, what was at stake. I overestimated this. I underestimated that. I regret it. It's pretty rare in, in world leaders. You know, I, the I, only I example I can think of is actually the president of Tanzania who oversaw this big, like, back to the country movement. You know, as a communist, eventually did uh, say, yeah, that was a mistake. That didn't work. Huh. And it's literally the only one I can think of, of something of that magnitude, right? Yeah. So, um, I don't know. The listeners can correct us. I'm sure they will. I'd be happy yes. to hear, as you suggested earlier, uh, alternative um, stories. But uh, the point is this, and, and this is where what I think is 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 fascinating. It's imaginable that every foreign policy decision was correct. <laughs> Unlikely, but imaginable. The part sure. that's interesting, <laughs> what? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I, but the point I, that's I, interesting, I think... the point that's interesting is how hard it is to imagine that something that one did that resulted in thousands, hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, millions of deaths was a mistake. Every fiber of one's being revolts at imagining that and therefore it's almost impossible to yep. to to uh, to imagine it as, as an error um you know I, i've said this before I, I i let's let's be agnostic for a moment about whether oj simpson is a murderer he i believe he may have if he were if he if he is a murderer I could imagine he does not think he is <laughs> uh, in that in that it's such a horrifying self-image for him uh, and that a person could, and it's what we're really talking about, can stand up publicly and through their actions, continue to believe that what they did was okay or that they didn't even do it at all in the case of O.J. Simpson. Yeah. Um, I, we have such a tremendous capacity as human beings. Uh, for self-deception, and I'm not again. I, I have no opinion on O.J. Simpson. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't opine on it. But all I'm saying is that we are the easiest people to feel to fool ourselves. Yeah, and um, and Walter Freeman seems to be an example of that. There, there is a reason that you know the the adage is that science proceeds one funeral at a time. Yeah, and that's even when the stakes aren't that high, right? That's when. It's just my career, my status, my um, reputation. But yeah, but when you add in the possibility that you've done something terrible to someone, I think this is especially true in medicine for obvious reasons, right? You're you're dealing with, first of all, incredibly complicated systems that we don't understand very well. Second of all, it's extremely hard to experiment, right? For for good reasons, we do not experiment on people the way we experiment on mice or dogs, um, and thirdly. You know the 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 variance and the outcomes. I mean, the the human body is it doesn't react the way a physical system does, right? Where you you build the large hadron collider, you're pretty sure what you're looking for, and you're pretty sure what the possible range of outcomes is, right? That's not the way the human body works. Um, just because you can't isolate one thing about the human body in the way that you, you know, like it's not that the physical universe is like less complicated than a human body, but you, it's easier to isolate one bit of it. Whereas when you're dealing with the human body, you're kind of pumping stuff into a system and then the system does its black box magic and then something pumps out at the other end. And we still don't understand how a lot of those systems work very well. We certainly understand better than we did in, in 1936 when Walter Freeman started operating, but we still much as a mystery. 
And so you can get, I mean, this is part of it is a thing that got cut. So that column that you read was cut down from 1600 words originally. From how, how, um, how big? 1600 words. That's where I started. That's my first draft. I often just write long drafts and then try to cut them down. Um, and it ended up and at I had a, uh, About 850, I think, um, okay. which is the length we run columns at. So there are a lot of... Um, a lot of things that I sort of liked that I had to cut out. And one of them was like with people, the stupidest treatment you ima- you can imagine, whatever, stroking caterpillar for fur at midnight um, or coffee enemas to take an example of th- something that people actually do. Um, it will, if you pump it into enough people, produce at least some apparent improvements in any condition that you're trying to treat, right? Because um, simply because the human body is extremely complicated and sometimes cancers spontaneously heal and sometimes uh, depression lifts. And with mental health, there's a particular problem, which I think if if people who have um, ever had their own problems with depression can probably attest, um, if you're really depressed and you think that something's going to help you, there's a shot that it'll help you just because you think it does. Right? Because, Sabo effect, the, sure. Right. Like, I think I think that moving across the country to California, I'm going to be in the sunshine and I'll be happy there now. Like there's a very good lots of people have done that. And like often what happens is they're they're lonely in the sunshine makes them seems bleak and unfriendly. Um, But some of them get better just because they moved across country because they thought they were going to get better. Right. Um, And now that's more of a mild affective disorder that's probably unlikely to, to treat. This is probably not going to treat your severe, persistent depression. That said. Um, it might produce a temporary lift, which to a doctor who is looking for, oh, look, we'll think, oh, moving to California fixes your problem. Um, and so these problems are enormous in medicine and, and make it even easier to fool yourself than in other kinds of, of science. Yeah, um, and when you combine that with the fact that the stakes are emotionally higher, you've got a real recipe for potential disaster. Yeah, in most of those cases, the other thing that happens isn't moving to California. It's just the passage of time. Random yep. things are going on inside your the chemical cauldron of your soul and heart and brain. And uh, even schizophrenia. I mean, John Nash, John Nash was among. Is my understanding was that there are some schizophrenics who just their schizophrenia recedes in late middle age. Yeah, and John Nash was among them. Yeah, um, and no one pretended, you know that something that was done 20 years before was the thing that made the difference just time passed and he was lucky but if you were a doctor who didn't have that information and you happen to be the person who did something to Don, john nash right around the time he started to get better you might think well this is a wonderful new treatment right i mean it's just yeah. these incredibly complicated systems that you're dealing with for that sure. offer rich opportunities to fool yourself now when we're prepping for this episode via email um I asked you for another example, and you came up with someone I think has come up a few times on this program. I find one of the saddest and most poignant chapters of uh, medical history, history of medicine, which is um, Semmelweis. Uh, talk about Semmelweis. Semmelweis uh, basically realized um, he was an early pioneer in the germ theory of disease. He was working with a hospital in which there were two wards uh, for women who were giving birth. Two wards for women giving birth. One was attended by doctors and the other was attended by midwives. And what he noticed was that the mortality rate on the midwife side was better. And what he eventually decided was that what was happening was the doctors are working on corpses. They're dissecting corpses. And because there's, and this is just going to horrify, it horrifies us now to think about this. They would go for like a badge of honor for a doctor at that point was to have a really bloody jacket, right? Because it proved that you were doing a lot of really hard work as a surgeon. And they would go from operating rooms on other patients straight to the, um, the, the maternity morgue. ward to the morgue. Well, they'd go to the, from the morgue, and they'd go yeah. to the morgue right. where they looked at women who died in childbirth to try to learn yeah. about it, and then go back and do some more deliveries. Right. And here's the thing is that like the womb after birth is basically an open wound, right? It is, it is. Um, I mean, it, there, a lot has gone on there. I mean, there's just a lot of abrasions inside the vaginal canal. And so of course, if you then stick your germy hands 
in that area, it's a huge risk for infection. So Semmelweis kind of realizes this, figures out that if you just douse yourself in carbolic acid, your mortality rate goes way down and it does not go well for him. He is, you know, people think this is crazy. And I think the Oedipus trap has given me a new way. You know, he, uh, as I understand it, died in an insane asylum, um, having been, you know, uh, roundly abused by his medical colleagues. Um, and the Oedipus trap gave me a new way to think about that because the normal story is like, gosh, those dumb surgeons. But then think about it. If you're a surgeon and you think you, you got into this probably because you want to help people, right? You think you're helping them. And here's some guy who comes along and tells you, oh, actually, you've been killing all your patients in your attempt to, attempt to help them. And every patient that you operated on, that you, you know, that you autopsied in an attempt to figure out what had gone wrong, actually made you kill more patients because you were spreading their germs, the sepsis. Um, could you allow yourself, right? It had to be younger doctors who had not done that, who could, who could. Yeah. Women were dying um, of corporal fever, which was an yep. infection. And um, as I think I've mentioned a long time ago, it's been a while since I talked about it on the program, but Semmelweis did a study to prove his point. And um, it was very small. Yep. Uh, the number of cases, the, the N was very small. And he was very, because he knew he was right, uh, for better, for worse. It, that was a different kind of. Uh, overconfidence and fooling yourself. He knew he was right, so um, he didn't make such a great study. And uh, it was very easy for the doctors of his day to dismiss it, which they did. And they had alternative theories, windows, air, open it, windows, bad air coming in and 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 killing the women. Or they, they had many, I'm sure there's more than one. That was, a, I know, a common one. And the, the horrible tragedy is we understand, we, a person, Ignan Semmelweis understood that you should wash your hands before you do childbirth. Now, here's the double tragedy. So, yes, it was really hard for physicians to concede that their own actions had killed their own patients. But the cost of the alternative of washing your hands was so small, right, to, to entertain the possibility that this, and Semmelweis was not an easy person, which is the other part of the tragedy. He was difficult and and he was probably arrogant. And so the idea that that this person was right, okay, so he probably wasn't, but all you had to do is wash your hands. And they couldn't bring themselves to do that for N reasons, but one of them is yours. And it's a huge one, which was, what if it worked? What if by washing your hands, your patients didn't die in childbirth anymore? And you think that would be overwhelmingly seductive. Why wouldn't you try it? But they couldn't. And thousands of women died after Semmelweis yeah. figured this out because his colleagues around the world, by the way, this isn't just one hospital. You know, he tried. He didn't just try to fix his hospital. He, he wanted to save right. the world like, like Walter Freeman. And he was right in this case. History has judged him correctly. His reputation is immortal, but not as immortal as it might have been had he had a different way of making his case. If he had, been, had well, a different kind of personality, if something. So I think I, so. That's that's a very rich point, and I would say two things: is is one. I mean, I hadn't thought about this but actually ex exactly right. Is that the what was being asked of them was tiny, and they couldn't even do that tiny thing because it might it conceded the possibility that they were mass murderers, right? Um, accidental mass murderers, completely innocent mass murderers. Yeah. In in no moral way can Oedipal. you blame a phys right? Yeah, just like Oedipus. That's the incredible just part like of Oedipus. the story. You couldn't blame a physician who killed his patients inadvertently, but it was still impossible to contemplate but the the other point is i mean i think this is really important is that people who are telling you you were wrong are actually they tend to be disagreeable people to say to surgeons like you've been killing people right what kind of personality does it take to make people un that unhappy it takes being a kind of disagreeable person the agreeable people just do what the other people are doing 
they don't study the thing that is going to make their colleagues feel bad. Right. That's, you know, we forget that like our urge to make the people around us feel good. It's a really important, there are really important reasons that we are that way. But the problem then is that the people who can resist that pull and see the thing that is true, even if it is going to be socially costly for them and psychologically costly for all of the people around them, they're not pleasant people. I mean, I, like over and over again, I've had this experience with like, um, you know, I remember there was a, a you know, like people will say to me, but this person who is suggesting this story is a deeply unpleasant person and they're crazy and they're like an ideologue and they're obsessed with some idealist. And I'm like, but that's everyone who's ever given me a story no one was reporting on. They're all like a definition because to, almost by definition, you have to be kind of crazy and a little bit antisocial and willing to buck the people who are pleasant, nice people to be around can't see it because for the same reason that their colleagues can't. Right. Like we're we're adept at fitting ourselves in as a species. Um, and so that is a problem that the people who do see these things almost always are actually not very good advocates for it, precisely because and it takes someone else who comes along and sees it, sees what the first person has seen and is a little bit more diplomatic about it, is a little bit less obstreperous. Right. Um to no. actually go and and then sell these these innovations to other people, and it also often takes the older generation di like dying and leaving science so that the new thing can come in. Well, I'm reminded of an episode in 2018 with Charlene Nemeth. Uh, her book was called "In Defense of Troublemakers," and we had a conversation along these lines. I think it's a tremendous insight that um, dissenters. Troublemaker is kind of a pejorative term. <laughs> uh, yeah. Contrarian, that's, that's kind of nice. Um, swims against the tide, somewhat of a compliment, but troublemaker is not such a compliment. And weirdo, crazy conspiracy theorist, definitely not a compliment. And the problem is that most of them are wrong. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 those crazy people who had theories about purple fever uh, being whatever they were, witchcraft. I'm sure there were some horrible, incorrect theories. Poor Mr. Semmelweis, or blessed Mr. Semmelweis, Dr. Semmelweis, had the right theory. And his colleagues, when confronted with it, were happy to lump him together with the crazies because of the Oedip Oedipus trap. And yeah. um, they were much happier in the dark, much happier going forward uh, in ignorance. Let's let's close with um, the challenge this poses for all of us when we think of uh, the phrase "follow the science." Uh, this is a phrase that has become popular in recent years. Um, I'm not that much of a troublemaker. This was Megan's suggestion. It's in her column, I think. So don't blame me for using that phrase because I, I want to just go along with the herd. But um, I don't like that phrase, follow the science. I find it I don't um, either. despicable. It's unscientific. It, that's the problem. So anyway, talk about why, what follow the science, how it relates to Mr. Freeman. Well, look, I think there was a point at which Freeman could have said, follow the science. Look at all these wonderful case histories I've done. Now, I think that it, even then it would have been much more contested than he would have suggested. And that's often true when people are telling you to follow the science. Like my, one of my questions often is which scientist? Yeah, who's? <laughs> right? And, you know, science, scientific consensus is important. I don't want to end up as a crank, right? Usually I follow the scientific consensus. But I also respect the fact that if someone says it's wrong and that's not prima facie evidence that they're a lunatic I should ignore, right? I, I'm, I'm a Bayesian about this. My prior is that normally the scientific consensus is the closest thing, is more likely to be right than some random person, right? That's the reasonable prior because I believe in the scientific method. That said, I think we should be, for example, especially conscious of in areas where the stakes are high, I am less likely to follow the science. Right. Because there I'm going to understand what are the personal stakes for the scientists here? First of all, we just I mean, before we get to anything serious, one personal stake is reputation. 
And something that you see over and over again, right, is that um, scientists who have their reputation staked on something will act so as to block, you know, senior scientists will try to block junior scientists who are saying they're wrong. Not always. There, there are admirable cases in scientific history of people being like, my gosh, I've been wrong for 30 years. You're amazing. That's fantastic. Good job, guy. <laughs> right. But there's <laughs> there's also a lot of cases of, of of older scientists fighting like hell to block off a compelling new theory that contradicts them. Um, so, you know, because we all do, we're not, this is not like, I don't want to say like, oh, science is bad, right? Everyone does this. Everyone wants to believe. You think about how many, the decades of denial that followed Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm not even going to talk about whether, you know, to go back to the Oedipus trap, whether the initial decision, could we have made a different decision? I think in Iraq, we could have. I think in Afghanistan, that's more com complicated. But here is a thing that I think is definitely true, which is that things weren't going well and they kept not going well. And we kept being like, no, they're going much better than we think. And no, they weren't. They were not going better than we thought. Um, you know, as soon as we left, the Afghanistan fell to the Taliban in, in incredi with incredible speed. We had accomplished nothing that we thought we were accomplishing there. Um, so that's one thing I, I think is um, important to think about that we all do this, that we all want, we see what we want to see, when, especially when our reputation is on the line. And when I think about, you know, the in my column, I said, you know, best thing to do, avoid Oedipus traps. And how do you do that? I think, number one, if the stakes are really high, you go in super cautiously, right? You do four... You, you follow up for a few years, you see how they did, you know, because the more that you, the faster that you move, the more likely you are to just rush past the, the point of no return. Again, not always an option, but try. The second thing is I think if you have taken one of these decisions, you just have to set up and kind of pre-commit to, I'm going to keep checking back and see if this was a wrong decision. And I got to move, even if it's bad, even if it's bad, I have to, I have to see it. And one way to avoid doing that is don't stake your reputation on it, which is something that Freeman did, right? He didn't just do these operations. He became like the face of lobotomy in the United States. He was incredibly adept at like, there's all these, it was really disturbing, as I said at the beginning, to realize he did a ton of press interviews. And every press interview brought more people saying, can you do a lobotomy, <laughs> right? Like, I have this problem, my sister has this problem, et cetera. Um, and the press, of course, had no way to assess this. It was totally uncritical. Um, there were some critical pieces later, but early on, you know, miracle medicine, um, which is a very common genre um, in, in our own day. Um, and then the third thing is, and I think this goes back to Semmelweis, is, is how, you know, at the, at, in extremis, you just have to say to yourself, no matter how shattering it would be to realize that I had done this, it's even more shattering. It would be even more shattering to keep making the mistake. And I think that's where the surgeons, uh, you know, the Semmelweis' surgeons uh, fell down, right? They, they didn't want to know and they didn't consider like, I'm going to kill more people so that I don't have to know I killed a lot of people already, right? That's, um, but we're bad at that. We are bad at it. And so I think this is always going to be a problem this is always going to be something anytime when there are big stakes, and I'm sure we can all think of examples of this today, um, you know, COVID stuff comes to mind and watching that follow the science narrative of COVID has been really appalling to me. And look, to be clear, I was, I was an advocate for lockdowns. I was an advocate for masks. I was an advocate for vaccine mandates. This was before, I think now that the, the vaccines do not seem to have enough impact on transmissibility for me to be willing to impose a mandate, but except on maybe healthcare workers um, and military personnel for a different reason, which is that it's, it's just better if they're, you know, like for military readiness, I think it's entirely fair to impose that mandate. But generally, I don't think that there's, it's, it's enough of an inhibitor of transmission to justify as a public health intervention. Um, so this is not coming from a place of like, I'm a radical skeptic about this stuff. I'm gonna go get my next booster. I believe in vaccines, I believe in all of it. That said, I believe masks work when used properly, which is not the same as saying that I think ma mass mandates work. Um, Cause I think they, I'm not sure about that. But that said, my side keeps saying, follow the science. And there was a, you know, there was a great example of this. The, the blogger, now newsletter writer, uh, Scott Alexander, had a back and forth with a guy who basically chided him for writing a long piece 
exploring all of the evidence about ivermectin and COVID. And I agree with Scott Alexander that ivermectin probably does not work and that the the reason that it kind of looked like it worked was A, artifact of small studies, and B, possibly that in countries with a high parasite load, it actually helps by killing your intestinal worms or other things that are sapping your health, but not by, which are also, by the way, can be immunosuppressive, um, but not by uh, like doing anything to COVID. Um, but I think that that was at one point an open question. And I think that the way that you address that open question is by is by doing exactly what Scott Alexander did. Deep dive into the evidence, expressing the uncertainties, showing why he ended up where he did. And he was chided because this is giving credibility to, you're, you're giving credibility to the conspiracy theorists. And I think that this is like a fundamentally anti-scientific attitude. You cannot do this because you are not, you are, you are depleting our precious ability to just say that people have to accept it, what we say on faith because we're scientists. And like, that's not science. I don't care. Like, I understand that the way you got the answer may have been scientific. But demanding that the rest of society just sort of kneel before Zod every time you wave your scientific credentials is, A, doesn't work. I fundamentally think does not work. I think it depletes trust in science rather than enhancing it. And look, I get it. I got so tired of arguing with bad conspiracy theories during bad conspiracy theorists during COVID. I'm still tired of arguing with them. Periodic eligibility, like, like you're making me really mad and I'm going to know about it this conversation. I'm just done with it for now. I don't have the energy, right? At the same time, I think you have to argue with them. And yes, you're not going to convince some of them because some of them just want to be mad. What they really want is not even a theory of COVID. They just want to be mad at liberals. And this gives them something like, and so, yes, yeah, so you're never going to convince those people. Fine. You still got to make the argument. And I think that this idea that there is, you know, in this house, we believe in science. Science is, what do you mean you believe in science? This is like, I believe in trees. I've seen them, right? Like they exist. Yes. But like, that doesn't imply anything about policy other than, you know, recognize, we need to recognize that trees exist. And that whole thing, the way that science has become like an identity is the exact opposite of science. And I noticed this even like, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I used to occasionally, because I'm an unpleasant person, enjoy kind of getting a little rise out of people who made fun of creationists by asking them to explain various evolutionary phenomena. And it turned out, of course, they had no idea. They didn't know anything about ev how evolution worked. All they knew was that they believed it because someone had told them it was true, right? And like, which is fine. We all have to do this. I like, I basically accept most of what I do every day on faith. I accept that, like, I have no idea how my plane works. I get on the plane. I assume it's going to fly. I assume that like aerodynamics is a thing. I assume those guys know what they're talking about. I like, because I can't, you cannot in our society is too complicated, but then you need to be epistemically humble and understand that like, you can't get bonus points for having accepted the correct theory on faith, right? Like that's not a virtue. It's more of almost an accident. And that you always have to be open to the possibility that something has gone hideously wrong. And I think, but especially, especially when you look at these questions where if a scientist or a politician has gone wrong, the results would be too horrific to contemplate. Those are the parts where you should absolutely like trust the science least, follow the science least, because that's the part where the scientist is going to be working hardest to fool themselves. It's the part where their politician is going to be working hardest to fool themselves. And you have to take that with the biggest grain of salt. My guest today has been Megan McArdle, who is actually, I think, a nice person as far as I know. Megan, thanks for being <laughs> part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.